Good evening, everyone. I'm Don Linebaugh, the Dean of the University of Maryland School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Thank you for joining us tonight. We've gathered here virtually tonight to celebrate the lives and contributions of three remarkable members of the MAP community. Founding Dean John Hill, architecture professor Carl Dupuy, and planning professor Sidney Brower. It is my great honor as Dean to host tonight's event, and it is a pleasure to see so many colleagues, friends, alumni, and family join us. I wish the circumstances were different and we were able to gather in person, but recognize that a bonus of this virtual format is that it erases the considerable distance between us, allowing more of the folks who were touched by John, Carl, and Sydney to be part of this experience. We thank you for being here, for contributing your stories and pictures, and for sharing this special event. John, Carl, and Sydney were visionaries and trailblazers and left indelible marks on how and what we teach in Maryland's Built Environment School. Through incredible foresight and ingenuity, they literally built the school, in John's case, and the programs in Carl's and Sydney's case that we know today and set a standard in teaching excellence followed by many. They leveraged their professional experience to shape how generations of practitioners observe, design, and care for our built environment. But as you know, John, Carl, and Sydney were more than teachers. They were mentors, good friends, and fierce advocates. They were also dedicated husbands and fathers. And because the best way to really know a person lost to us is through the people they left behind, tonight's program will tell their stories through the voices of former colleagues and students and those who knew them best. We begin tonight's dedication with Sydney Brower. Sid was a founding member of the Urban Studies and Planning Program, one of just three faculty working out of small university offices in Baltimore in 1979. During his over 30 years at the University of Maryland, Sidney was a constant, thoughtful presence, relaying his experience in neighborhood design as an accomplished practitioner in Baltimore. He was revered by his students and colleagues for his wit and easygoing nature and for his generosity of time and spirit. Sidney chaired the search committee that hired me so he was the first person I met in the school. And when I arrived in town, he immediately invited me to Baltimore for a driving tour of all of its amazing historic spots that ended in lunch with Cynthia at their home. It was really special and coming from someone who really knew the city, it gave me an appreciation and perspective I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. I'm very pleased now to welcome Professor Emeritus Howie Baum, planning alum Chris Ryer, and Sydney's daughter, Kate Brower, who will now each share a few words about Sydney's legacy. Um, I, I have a disembodied voice, I believe. I have uh, audio, but not video, but that's sufficient. Um, John's, uh, Don's reminiscence about when there were three of us in Baltimore reminds me of the year when there were three faculty and two students in the planning program, and we've obviously done much better since then. Um, I met Sydney 40 years ago when I was younger than my years and trying to figure out uh, what I knew and how to teach it. Sydney had many years on me. He had significant professional accomplishments, and he spoke with an authoritative South African accent. Um, to my surprise and great pleasure, uh, we became good colleagues and good friends. And I want to say a little about Sydney and what I appreciate about him. Sydney was curious and enthusiastic. He found the world puzzling and took pleasure in exploring it. He taught not simply to pass on what he knew, but to learn with his students. Occasionally, students in his studio complained that he didn't give them sufficient direction, that since he was asking them to study something complicated, and obviously he knew the main questions and their answers, he should give them the necessary guidance to arrive at these answers. 
And then Sidney would explain that he had picked something to study that he didn't understand, and he was counting on the students to figure it out. Why, after all, uh, would he spend time on something he already knew about? And soon enough, students would find that he was generous with what he knew. He helped them see their way to the core of things. And he accompanied them with a sense of humor that reminded them how much fun it all was. Sidney was interested in important things, neighborhood, community, and home. And he wrote original, insightful books about each of these. Uh, not because they were important in some abstract theoretical sense, but because they mattered to him. He was concerned with three questions. Uh, when do we feel we belong? When do we feel safe? And centrally, when do we feel at home? I suspect these questions mattered to him in part because he had made his own home in two different countries. Because at some point he could no longer feel at home in the country of his birth and had to make a new home elsewhere. Thus his own movement gave focus to the question of what people need to feel at home and prepared him to recognize that different answers serve for different people in different places. He was a designer by nature and optimistic he could create settings that would help people feel more at home. The titles and subtitles of his books make clear he had ideas about what satisfied people. He wrote of good neighborhoods, successful community design, and what makes home environments look good. But following his own experience, he didn't presume to tell people where or how to live because he believed design was good only insofar as it responded to what people felt, believed, and wanted. I have, I have two favorite stories about Sydney's teaching. For years, I taught a course on community. It was my favorite course. And over the semester, I led students through all the intricacies and complexities of community. And near the end of the semester each time, I asked Sydney to come talk with students about uh, physical design for community. So he spoke for about perhaps an hour and a half, sharing his most recent ideas from a book or an article. And then when he was done, students, one after another, said, oh, that's what this course has been about. And predictably, uh, final papers cited his writings in support of their conclusions. A second incident from the same class illustrates Sidney's commitment not simply to understand what helped people feel at home, but to creating a sense of home in the classroom. One year, as always, he began his session in my class by asking students to introduce themselves. And a woman from Namibia simply began speaking to him in Afrikaans. And though none of the rest of us understood a word, he went on with her for several minutes so he could give her the feeling of home she apparently needed at that moment. Sydney and I spent countless hours driving between Baltimore and College Park. I remember most his enthusiastic reviews of symphony concerts he'd heard, or books he'd read, or new restaurants he and Cynthia had discovered, or some doings of Kate or Gideon, or by chance he'd run into a former student who was doing well. I remember also his frequent invitations to come into the house for a cup of tea, always with milk. After we talked for a while, sometimes I wondered if I was keeping him from something else. But he let me understand that talking, being at home was the main thing, the rest could wait. Sidney was a thoughtful teacher and a good colleague. Most of all, he was a lovely man. We were fortunate to be able to spend time with him. Thank you, Howie. This is Chris Ryer. I'm the director of planning for the city of Baltimore. Um, I met Sydney in 1984, um, back when there were the three faculty that Howie just mentioned. 
at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, a small campus in downtown Baltimore as part of the School of Social Work. I recently returned to Maryland from California and I was a bit lost. And, and I found the planning program, it sort of fit my dreams of living and working in Baltimore and, and Sydney sort of took me under his wing. In 1985, I moved to Baltimore. In 1986, I, I graduated with an internship at this very department that I'm director of now. Um, but Sydney led our studio project. And while we were constantly challenged by Howie and Mel, it was Sydney we followed around like little kids peering over his shoulder because he was always doing something interesting. And it was usually around the interaction between men or people and their environment. I remember a studio project uh, with Sydney where the 10 of us, I believe, that were in that class uh, rebelled. We were unhappy. Two of, two of the students weren't doing any of the work and the other eight were doing all of it. And we were outraged, the injustice of it all. And we all got together and we went to Sydney and we poured out our complaints. And he looked at us and he said, so get used to it, it's part of life. And in fact, that was probably the thing I learned the most in that program was how to work with people around their environment. So I wanted to thank Sidney and I wanted to thank his family um, for Sidney because he was such an important part of my uh, graduate school education. He was way before we learned about William Wright and all the other people writing in this field at the time. In fact, later when I came to the planning department, I discovered <clears throat> all of his work in the Harlem Park inner block park work that he had done years before I got to the department, work that his daughter is now continuing to this day. That must have made quite an impression if you have your daughter working on something that you worked in a generation ago. My father was also involved in fighting the um, apartheid regime in uh, South Africa, which may have been part of the mystique of, of Sydney to me, Some, one of the things that originally uh, drew me to him. But I shall miss him, and I'm sure all of the folks on this call will miss him, and I thank him uh, for everything he did to me. I hope if you haven't purchased his book or books, I hope you do that and uh, donate to the Sidney Brower International Travel Scholarship. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, this is Kate Brower. On behalf of the entire Brower family, my mother Cynthia, brother Gideon, dad's sister Hazel, and myself, I want to thank everyone at the University of Maryland School of Architecture who has been involved in putting this wonderful event together. As many of you know, dad was originally from South Africa. Let me start with a few words about dad's background. Dad and Hazel grew up in Uppington, a farming town in the northwest part of South Africa, where his parents owned and operated a small hotel. He went on to study architecture at the University of Cape Town, where he and mom met. After university, dad started his own architecture practice. Mom and dad married in 1961 and moved to the United States so dad could pursue a master's degree in planning at MIT. He was particularly inspired by Kevin Lynch, who was teaching there. Dad actually turned down a scholarship from the South, Afri South African government because it required several years working for them once he returned. 
Since both he and mom did not agree with the apartheid policies, they used their savings to pay the MIT tuition and to come to the US on their own. And after MIT, they moved to Baltimore in 1964. You all know my dad as a teacher and colleague, so I thought I'd say a little bit about him as a husband and a father. He was always a steady, calm, and creative presence in our lives. He encouraged us to pursue our interests. Mom, her painting, printmaking, and watercolors. Gideon, his writing and public radio reporting. And me, my photographs and artwork. In high school, I discovered photography. And dad would often take me to areas of the city that he thought might be interesting to photograph. And usually he waited in the car patiently reading a book while I walked around to explore. When Gideon got into cycling in high school, dad borrowed a 10 speed bike and they did a two day ride from the Bay Bridge to Rehoboth. It was over a hundred degrees and I don't think he'd ridden a bike in decades, but it was just no problem for him. Dad was naturally good at things and he always had a project. Either he was writing a book or he was printing photos in the dark room he ribbed, rigged up on the third floor, or he was making yogurt or baking bread or rolls or a particular bundt cake that became such a staple in our house that we just started calling it Brower cake. There was always a yellow legal pad on hand with sketches and notes. My mom has been the artist in the family. She had her studio upstairs and paintings and exhibitions that dad was enormously proud of, but he was very artistic himself. He drew and played the piano and the recorder and he designed furniture. There are a couple of tables in our house that dad designed. One of them has an elaborate mosaic that mom created and dad fabricated. He cut all the glass tiles and laid them down by hand. And I might add, it's a very intricate design. Gideon and I grew up in a house filled with beloved objects like these that my parents had made themselves or found on their many travel adventures. Watching them to discuss and debate the perfect color for an accent wall, the type of frame to use for an artwork, the texture and color of brick to use for the front pathway, all have influenced Gideon and me to creative careers. It also taught us to value creative collaborations. Dad had a positive influence on people and the world around him. He loved his teaching and research so much that he did not feel the need to retire until he was 81. After he retired, he rekindled his interest in ceramics and in weaving, and he wove beautiful scarves, some of which he sold commercially. I happen to be wearing one of, my scar of his scarves myself. He loved going to museums and movies and concerts, and he traveled, but he also had the ability to make his world interesting wherever he was. He had a charming and gentle sense of humor, and in general, I think he was the most positive, self-motivated, and contented person I've ever known. He took a genuine interest in so many people, as many of you know. But in terms of what he needed to be happy, I think he just needed my mom and his family and his work and his projects and his loom and maybe some chocolate ice cream and maybe the Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle and possibly a cup of tea and he was all set. Since I moved back to Baltimore 10 years ago and started working for city government as a planner myself, I've often met people that dad has worked with or taught over the years. When they hear my name, they ask if we are related and always ask after him with sincere affection. I feel so proud to be able to say I'm Sidney Brower's daughter. He was an amazing husband to my mom and an amazing father to Gideon and myself. He continues to inspire our family in so many ways and will forever be part of our lives. Dad, we love you and we miss you.
thank you, Kate, Howie, and Chris for these really lovely tributes to a good friend and colleague to Sydney. John Hill was the founding dean of the then School of Architecture, recruited from Kentucky by the university in 1968 to create the first architecture program in the, in the state. He brought with him a white paper detailing what the university would need to do to prove its mettle in the collegiate arena and to deliver the caliber of practitioners that the regional firms were clamoring for. His recommendations, all of which came to fruition, included space for collaboration and work, an innovative and socially minded faculty, and a hands-on creative curriculum that set the framework for eventually adding programs in planning, historic preservation, and real estate development. John taught and led under the guise of being a quote, force for good, working to build and grow the program and instill in his students that social justice, environmental stewardship, and community building go hand in hand with good design. A true Kentucky Colonel, John started a long-standing Kentucky connection with Maryland that continued with my hiring in 2004. It was a great privilege and honor to stand with him at the 50th anniversary gala of the school as I became the school's newest dean. It's now my honor and privilege to welcome Professor Emeritus Roger Lewis, architecture alum Al Rubling, John's wife Catherine Mahan, and his daughter Robin Hill. Uh, I unmuted myself, I think, successfully. I hope everybody can hear me. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, uh, this is a big honor uh, for me to uh, talk about John Hill, and I could go on for a lot more than five minutes um, talking about our history. Uh, I, uh, I first met John in early 1968, uh, just before I went to Russia. Uh, and uh, I had been a Peace Corps volunteer in Tunisia, had come back, uh, was, was finishing my internship, and I saw a newspaper article in the Washington Post with a little picture of John. He looked like he was about, oh, 18, 19 years old, announcing that there was gonna be a new school of architecture at the, at the University of Maryland. There had been no architecture school in the state. And I just picked up the phone and cold called him after uh, reading the article. Uh, he invited me to come out and give a lecture. He wanted me to tell, talk about my experience looking at industrialized housing in Russia. Uh, after the talk, um, he uh, soon asked me if I'd be willing to or be willing to consider joining the faculty as one of the new founding faculty members. And I thought, well, yeah, that's I think that's something I could do uh, and would be interested in doing. Uh, but I will tell you, I was also interested at that time, very committed to the idea of private practice and designing real. <coughs> so uh, I say that because one of the things I'm going to talk about in a few minutes is how supportive John was always of us, the architecture faculty, and particularly the design faculty, uh, and, and our, those of us who were uh, sharing our interests in both teaching and practice, in both, both theory and technology. So I, I, I always felt greatly, greatly supported uh, by John in that pursuit. But we, John and I also, John, I should say John's family and my family were really intertwined uh, in different ways beyond academia for um, over half a century. I remember going to uh, first meet his family. I remember young Lucy, Robin, Arissa, and Erickson uh, in a house, I think it was in Carter Rock Springs in Montgomery County, um, at a time when, uh, I think this was really the first year I was at Maryland. And uh, I'm happy to say that I remember all of the, the, the Hill children uh, very well. They're not children anymore. Uh, I'm really looking forward, by the way, to hearing from Robin. Um, anyway, we were intertwined in many ways uh, beyond school. Uh, 
including some of you may remember uh, that we, there was a period when John and Catherine uh, Mahan and my wife Ellen and I and some other partners own, bought and owned a house in, on the coast of Maine, east of Eden, we called it. It was east of Eden Street. Uh, we, uh, we had a lot of fun uh, owning that, occupying it, sharing adventures. And uh, I, I have to tell you, uh, I didn't mention this before, John was a Navy veteran. Some of you may not know that. He was, uh, he was a commissioned officer in the Navy which uh, I think I thought was going to make him a wonderful uh, crew member when uh, in, the, in the sailboating days of the School of Architecture. Do you all know that, or some of you know that there was a period when about six or seven of us on the faculty owned sailboats. And I, uh, I sailed the, my uh, sloop to Maine uh, in the summer of 1983 with John as a crew member. And uh, there are about 10 or 15 stories I could tell you about that. John was, uh, as has already been said by the Dean, by uh, Mr. Dean Linebell, John really brought exceptional professional academic and leadership experience to the University of Maryland, and not, not the least of which was because of his experience in the Navy. Uh, he had gone to Rice Institute in Houston, Texas. I grew up in Houston, about uh, 10 blocks from Rice. I almost went there. Uh, I think some of you also know that he studied after Rice uh, in the Navy. He went back to the University of Pennsylvania, not back to for the first time, to get a Master of Architecture degree in 1959, having studied with Lou Kahn. And uh, that's, as, you, as some of you may know, Lou Kahn, he was able to get Lou Kahn to come to the dedication of the School of Architecture building that many of you uh, learned to uh, design and think about architecture. Uh, it was amazing that in five years, actually only five years after the school started, we got our accreditation. Uh, but what maybe is most significant for some of you, certainly for me, is that John launched the school's initial study abroad program in 1971, the year that we invited Charles Moore to come as our, one of our first visiting professors. And uh, John, along with me and Charlie Moore, uh, led a trip of about 17 students in my count is right. Our first graduating class of 72. We went on a five year whirlwind trip to Europe and Tunisia. Uh, and uh, I remember being quite surprised. Uh, I think it was after we flew to London that I learned that John had never been to Europe. It was his first trip to Europe. So in a way it was extraordinary uh, to, to experience that trip, not only with the students, most of whom were almost none of them had been to Europe, but with John, for whom it was new and extremely uh, stimulating. I think that, uh, I, I think it was mentioned that he was very interested in the notion of architecture relating not just to buildings, but to the form and function of traditional towns, local communities, historic urban neighborhoods. I think one of the other things, in addition to the travel abroad programs that John helped uh, really the nurture and I thought uh, always made uh, for interesting studio experiences was, was looking at, taking it on as pr problems of study for research, uh, the, the, the rethinking, the reforming, the uh, new ideas about existing and particularly historic towns in the state of Maryland. I wanna talk a couple of minutes, more minutes about some principles that John brought to his work, his creation and shepherding of the program at Maryland. Uh, one of the things he, from the very beginning, always felt strongly about was there would be no single unique design style embraced or preferentially taught at the school. There would not be a, a school design program or a school, uh, if you will, uh, eth ethos based uniquely on the personal aesthetic philosophy and work of any one professor or star architect. John instead, uh, as evidence with Charles Moore's invitation, he instead invited uh, year after year distinguished architects as visiting professors for a semester or two to come and introduce diverse ideas and uh, their experiences. And I think that was really wise academic and uh, pedagogical strategy. Likewise with the, the faculty, John was very, I thought very diligent and very responsible to uh, make sure that he had a diverse faculty and, and a faculty strong in technology 
and history theory as much as design. And uh, uh, as I said earlier, he was, he was particularly good at supporting those of us who were design faculty professors, uh, those of us who also practiced architecture uh, at the same time as we were teaching. And that was, that was a challenge to juggle both of those things, but he, he supported it, he encouraged it. Uh, his theory being that, that having some of the design faculty, people who were uh, building things as well as thinking about building and, and uh, exploring design philosophies and theories, uh, his notion was that this would really result in a more holistic and a more uh, comprehensive experience and creative uh, stimulation for our students. And I, I to this day, can continue to believe that. Uh, I, I always felt throughout John's deanship that we had a very healthy collegial sense of community and camaraderie within the school, which isn't always the case. I know when I came to, I came to Maryland after I'd been at MIT uh, for many years and uh, MIT, there were faculty who wouldn't even talk to each other. Who wouldn't, if they saw someone coming down the hall that they didn't like, they'd, they'd duck into a room or not cross paths with, paths with them. In fact, when I came to DC, I had no interest in academia or teaching. It was, it was the notion of joining John Hill in the creation of a new school of architecture at Maryland that, that made me change my mind. John, uh, John's attitude about uh, fostering a healthy collegial community really was a, a reflection of him. Uh, it's, it's to me in some ways the most memorable part of his legacy. Uh, he was always, in my perception, warm-hearted, generous, open-minded, thoughtful, always respectful, and, and really, truly a well-mannered gentleman. Uh, he fostered friendships uh, among faculty, staff, and students. Uh, he was very charming much of the time, sometimes stoic, rarely lost his temper, and I know that very well because John and I, in addition to teaching and sailing and skiing together, uh, <clears throat> we actually practiced together. We did a number of projects together in practice in the late 70s. Let me conclude by saying that I think the University of Maryland alumni, of whom there are many on this webinar, uh, I think they would all admit that they were inspiringly educated, in part thanks to John's academic and professional leadership. And, and I say to you that you are really the evidence, the best evidence that John's success as a dean, as a teacher, as a colleague and friend, you, you, in my opinion, are the greatest tribute to and embodiment of his enduring legacy. So I just want you to know, for, I for personally feel that John Hill, who was a lifelong friend and colleague, uh, I will profoundly miss him. He will be lovingly remembered by me and I think many others. Thank you for letting me uh, talk to you. Good evening. My name is Al Rubling, and um, I was a student of John's. In the professional careers class that I've taught at the school for over the past 10 years, I've had my students think about their future life backwards and write their obituary an interesting task for a 20-something. After that exercise, I lead a discussion that one's life is graphically depicted on a gravestone as the dash between the date of birth and death. And the absurdity that an entire lifetime can be summarized by one simple character. There's so much more to one's life than is shown between those two moments. John Hill's dash is huge. I first met John 47 years ago after I received my letter of acceptance into the School of Architecture on July 17, 1973. And I visited the campus to accept my enrollment. I wanted to meet John because I wanted to confirm that the letter was authentic because his signature was rubber stamped upon it. 
Our first meeting was very memorable and made quite a few impressions upon me. Before I graduated, I had John as a studio crit in the Rock Hall studio, and he was my thesis sponsor. What I learned from John was how he taught life situations. The quintessential gentleman's gentleman. It was never about John. John was always so thoughtful, engaged, and always anticipated your next thought. He had a gentle way of teaching memorable lessons. At a cocktail party, John was the unassuming, humble, well-spoken, very well-attired architect that was always happy to see you and to ask you all the questions. It was never about John. So I'm giving this perspective memory of John W. Hill's dash, not as a son, brother or colleague, but as a former student. John taught me a great deal just through his example as a role model. So I was blessed to have him rubber stamp me into the School of Architecture at the beginning of my career, be my studio crit, help me through my thesis, and attend my investiture as chancellor of the AIA College of Fellows, completing a full circle of my professional life. I learned many life lessons and admirable traits from John. I use many every single day, whether in my firm, in the classroom, or with my family. He has had a profound impact upon me and all whom I engage. Thank you, John, for making a difference for all of us. Miss Catherine. Okay, I'm here. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, I got one yes. Okay, well, thanks so much for the opportunity to um, participate in this lovely event. It's really, it's been a tough year for all of us and for the School of Architecture. And so it's, it's really good to be able to come together um, at a time like this. And it's nice for me to see so many um, I can't see your faces, but to see your, the names of so many uh, friends and colleagues and alumni. Um, I'm a little bit out of order, but I did want to make a couple comments about Carl and Sydney also. Um, Sydney, we knew both in Baltimore and in College Park. And um, I think I especially immediately shared his artist's temperament. Um, we enjoyed the times we spent together uh, we had a lovely dinner at their home. We loved to see Cynthia's watercolors and his weaving um, and getting to know their daughter, Kate. Um, hi, Kate. Good to see you and hear you tonight. Um, and we'll always remember his, his ready smile and his friendly manner. Um, Carl, I met uh, early on when I was first getting to know the School of Architecture and the folks at the school. And we shared a weekend together at the Chalafont in Cape May that uh, Dave Fogel had been working on uh, restoring. And uh, at that time, their son Rick was, was there and he was about the age of our son Wilson. And I think you're here tonight, Rick, I hope. Um, I think both of, uh, of you were under one year old, so I doubt that you remember this, but. <laughs> It was a wonderful weekend, and there were lots of other fun times we spent together. The faculty retreats, the Beaux-Arts Ball, going to uh, Dave's Beach House in uh, Rehoboth, talking about Kiplin Hall, and these were all such great memories. 
Now, I guess, as you all know, the architecture school was really John's baby. Uh, as if he didn't have enough babies in his life. As you all know, he had six kids. Uh, but for him, get, having the opportunity to start an architecture school from scratch and to have been given so much independence in doing so, that really, I think, was the defining event of his life. And he spoke often to me with so much fondness about how much freedom and independence he had and how much trust was placed in him. You know, he said, they just said, what do you think an architecture school needed? And he said, I think we need a shop and we need a library, we need a slide library, we need a snack bar, I need to hire faculty, on and on and on. And he was aware over the years at how much more cumbersome all of these things would have been. But in, in his time, he was really given free reign to do all these things. So I think that was something that was a special treat for him because he could really realize his vision of the school. Um, the other thing that I can remember being so impressed by over the years was the, and Roger mentioned this, this sense of collegiality among the faculty at the school that was so important to him. Um, I had the opportunity in my professional life to serve on accreditation um, uh, visiting teams for um, landscape architecture programs. And, um, and often, you know, they were in architecture schools as you might, um, as you might imagine. But um, I'd, I was very much aware of the, the tensions between factions in the faculty and differences about who had their door open and who had their door closed and um, the things that different faculty members would share with us at various other schools. And I just was so surprised when I would think back on University of Maryland and how important the, the sense of collegiality and cooperation um, was to John. You know, his idea of having, he wanted to have a round table in the conference room so that nobody would be at the head. And of course, it, Turned out he had to have an oval table, but I think he, he accomplished the same thing. So um, he did, in the course of, of um, our life together, he had other opportunities. You know, headhunters would come to him and, um, you know, try to uh, woo him to other schools or to move up higher in administration. And didn't he want to be a provost or did he want to be a college president? And he never did. I mean, he said to me, no, it was, he wanted to be at the school. The school was his baby. And he wasn't interested in administration. He was interested in architecture. So, um, so he stayed in Maryland and I'm, I'm so glad for it. And then of course, you know, in time he had to trust others with his baby. And I can say from my own experience leaving the firm that I created, how difficult that can be, how to trust other people with your seemingly fragile creation. But um, I think John it was ready and he trusted the people. He trusted the culture that he had created. And, um, and it was such a joy to him over the years to see the school not only continue, but to thrive and to excel and to see the, the graduates succeed and start firms, create wonderful buildings, to win awards, um, to be elected to the College of Fellows. This was all such a source of pride and satisfaction for him. And then, of course, the, the crowning event was the 50th celebration at the Library of Congress. I'm sure, as um, Al was saying, to look backward on your life, I, it really... Uh, I can't imagine that he ever thought that he was going to be there at the Library of Congress to celebrate 50 years of the architecture school that he had founded. Um, I love this picture because it also has his sense of adventure. <laughs> um, anyway, at this point, I think all I could really say, and I think what John would want to say is he's so proud of all of you and Keep up the good work. Thank you. 
Now I want to introduce Robin, John's daughter, who's on the faculty at the University of California at Davis. I have, I'm sorry for the, the noise. I have, I must stand. I hate this Zoom world and I'm gonna, Dad, I'm standing for you. So, good evening. I am so honored to have the opportunity to remember my father with you and to share some of the myriad ways that he impacted our lives. If nothing else, this gathering means so much to our family for whom the grieving process has been challenged by the isolation imposed upon us by COVID. I'm Robin Hill, John's second of six children. Um, in that uh, first group would be Lucy, Arissa, and Erickson. The four of us he had with his wife, Carol, our mother, and the other two, Wilson and Annie, with Catherine. And John also had eight grandchildren. So you wouldn't be surprised to learn that all of, all of his children and grandchildren are creatives in one form or another. We are a lively crew made up of designers, educators, a chef, crafters, artists, musicians, rappers, healers, wilderness seekers, farmers, scientists, and animal rescuers. What dad wanted for all of us this was that we be happy, secure, and be loved. Often, especially in the last few years when he suddenly realized that he was getting old at the age of 87, <laughs> he would express how gratified he felt that we were all okay. Last year, dad and Catherine moved into a beautiful senior living complex close to their former home in Towson. Dad was excited to have easier access to friends, a library, concerts, and an art barn, and a gym. As you know, he was on the mend from a terrible fall in which he sustained a head injury and was working hard to get his life back on track despite the frustration of physical and emotional challenges. The move was an epic undertaking, but he and Catherine did it, mostly Catherine. <laughs> And they were starting to settle into this new chapter of their lives. Sadly, dad did not get to enjoy his new home for very long due to health setbacks, but he found great satisfaction in knowing that Catherine would thrive there with or without him. In 2017, dad and Catherine came up to New York to see my solo exhibition in Chelsea. The show was called There Was and consisted of collections of objects that I consider to be self-made sculpture. Sea bricks, concretions, industrial detritus, and a monumental cyanotype of a house collapsing in a forest. Dad quietly studied the forms while he searched for an inn. I will never forget him saying as he stood before my pile of sea bricks, as though at a lectern, I understand this work as a morphology, a study of objects that are meant to be contemplated to teach you something. We talked about scale, accumulation, time, and chance. He got it. He got me. When my dad talked, I took notes. There were so many other times when my father stopped in his tracks to wonder and theorize about something that caught his attention. Once on a bike ride in the small town where I live in the Sacramento Valley, we stopped to marvel at a false front on a humble building near my studio. He loved how the false front gives grandeur to otherwise nondescript utilitarian buildings, giving the passers-by, the citizens, an aesthetic experience whose purpose is to do nothing less than enhance lives and give dignity to towns. In that moment, he remembered his friend Charles Moore. He told me how much he missed him and how brilliantly he wrote on such topics. On my visit to Maryland a few years ago, I mentioned that I needed a replacement button for my vintage pink silk raincoat. No ordinary button would do. Loving a challenge, my father remembered a button store tucked away in a tiny strip mall in Towson that couldn't remember where it was or the name of it. He, Catherine and I, set out to find the only button store in a 20 mile radius that Google could point us to. And I ended up getting the perfect button 
and experiencing the best unintentional quasi-museum outing one could ever hope for. We could not believe the floor to ceiling display of buttons, which you can see in my background screen, organized by color. We laughed and exclaimed over the histories, the attire and the lifestyles that the buttons, many of them wildly ugly, might belong to. Dad agreed to give a talk to my students at UC Davis a while back. They were studying ideas of the miniature and the gigantic in sculpture. As they entered the room, they were greeted with a line from William Blake's Auguries of Innocence, which my father had written on the blackboard. To see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. A robin red breast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. We are so very grateful to know that there are many others who have had the opportunity to wonder and explore with dad, John. Thank you so much for keeping his memory alive in the work you do, the stories you tell and the lessons you give to those around you. The University of Maryland School of Architecture will always be in our minds and hearts. You are as much a part of our family's story as dad is to yours. Thank you all for these wonderful remembrances uh, for John, Robin, Catherine, Al, and Roger. Um, really wonderful uh, memories uh, about a, a true scholar and gentleman. To colleagues, students, and friends, Carl Dupuy was a force of nature, a giant within the architecture program at the University of Maryland, whose passion for urbanism, architectural history, and building craft was a foundational part of the curriculum. Carl led a number of studios during his 40-year tenure and guided hundreds of students through the hard-won thesis process. He was known for his tough love and studio. He was, you might say, architecture's Lou Grant, to use a Mary Tyler Moore reference. He had a biting wit and possessed a fearless, spontaneous energy. Some of you will remember his forced marches on study abroad trips. Every person who knew Carl undoubtedly has a good Carl story and a favorite phrase, endearingly called Dupuyisms. Carl and I shared a love of Kiplin Hall and Yorkshire and had many, many long conversations uh, about our interests. And I also so enjoyed serving and was honored to serve with him on many, many thesis committees during his time at the school. I'm now really pleased to welcome Professor Emeritus Ralph Bennett, architecture alum Jessica Leonard, and Carl's son, Rick Dupuy, who will share a few of their favorite memories of Carl. <laughs> Afterwards, we will hear from Professor Brian Kelly, and architecture alum and chair of our Board of Visitors, Craig Spangler, about how as a community, we can preserve the memories of Carl, John, and Sydney through scholarships. Thanks, Don. Can I be heard? We can hear you, Ralph. I can hear you. Thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to remember Carl with so many of you who knew and appreciated him. For me, Carl hasn't gone away. Carl, you never did want to move out of your office. It's still there for you now, the amazing library on cities and urban design, topped by the impressive city studies done by your students, the basketball autographed by Gary Williams behind me, the picture of an American dirigible over Lower Manhattan below it, the poster for the exhibition after your sabbatical in India, the map drawings of four Montgomery County villages, 
the Murphy's Law poster next to your academic gown, the pictures of you with students on your trips, and the pictures of Rick and Paul. Your exhibition board still hangs on the wall outside your office, showing your amazing experience when we all made those boards. Yours is still more than worth reading. Lindley and I don't need you to move a thing. You and I arrived in 1977, me from Boston and you from New York. You must have come to Maryland to invent Architecture 654, urban form, after your time planning in New York. The course is legendary. I once asked you if we could record a semester of your lectures, but you turned us down, saying they were always changing. I hope some of your former students have bootlegged some recordings of your lectures. You weren't a paper publisher. Your public was your students and colleagues whose heads are still carrying the then new idea that architects could and should design cities. You led the development of one of the school's significant and still active strengths, that buildings cannot be conceived as forms in isolation, but rather they inevitably deal with their contexts one way or another. It's no accident that a number of us are charter signers of the Congress for the New Urbanism, which was established in Alexandria in 1993. I'll always think you watched with amusement as a movement called New formed around the ideas you had been teaching for years. Accordingly, you taught design in your own supportive, outspoken way. You insisted design happen at all scales, the city, of course, but the building and its details were always part of the effort. And you took leadership of specific years in the curriculum, the entire studio program, and other housekeeping needed to maintain the quality of the program. At the end, you became the master of the thesis program, the ultimate reliable certifier of the quality of the student work of our graduates. You urged them to have an attitude, clearly an autobiographical intention, and make a statement. What about your project is architectural? Take a position and get to work. You and I had a faux retirement in 2008, a wonderful excuse for a great party. Your partying had mellowed by then, but your performance at retreats when they were held away from campus were memorable uh, from that era when you had a full head of hair and were six feet tall. We didn't leave after that party, and you were ready to come back this fall to lead another group of thesis students to graduation this month, and you really didn't want to give up your office. It certainly wasn't reticence which made you as interesting to those who sat with you on reviews as we assumed you were to the students. You were always reliably and explicitly directive without being mean. We all wanted you on our reviews. You had many publics, explorers in the boundary waters between Canada and the United States, the sports enthusiasts who told wild stories about your loud enthusiasm at Maryland basketball games, and of course your many trips to England with generations of students who will never forget seeing those towns through your binoculars, as Jessica will describe. Before your illness, on an off day, you said you felt like hammered garbage. But your stoicism toward the end fooled us about the seriousness of your condition. Adequate, you said, when it was a lot less. <clears throat> As I said to Peg the other day, how I miss kvetching with you about almost anything. Your lunch visits to our Silver Spring office heavily populated by your former students and fellow round ball fans, were a welcome time to take stock of almost everything. So the invitation is out, lunch at any time, and we can meet in your office. Jessica?
Ralph, that was so good. You're like making me tear up. Um, I am so honored to be able to share some of my experiences with uh, Carl and uh, speak on behalf of students, but I know that there are so many memories and I really hope everyone will include some of those in the chat and Ralph, just some of your stories reminded me I got to go to one of those Terps games and sit with him and hear him cheer wildly um, while I was in school. But um, over the course of um, my time at Maryland, which um, is going on 15 years ago now, um, I had the privilege of all my grad school semesters having a Carl teach a course. And so he taught urban where he reminded us all that the urban train was leaving the station every day. He led 600 Studio where he spent hours with each of us as we learned how to detail a building and build large scale models. I don't think I ever realized the, um, the craft and the skill that it uh, taught for him to teach at such a, a broad scale of the city and then to understand the details of how a building goes together. Then he coordinated thesis and prothesis for our class. It was such a bonus because each of us got to have him uh, like a member of our thesis committee. One of my favorite parts of the student is that if you didn't know an answer on a test, he told you just to write something you do know. Because for him, learning wasn't about passing a test and that gave us all the freedom to fail, to grow, and to an excel in our own way. The summer after I graduated, he offered a class um, for studying abroad in Great Britain. I jumped at the, the chance to go back to London, but didn't realize this trip was gonna be so much more. I know some of you on this webinar uh, were with me on that trip. We chased, sprinted after, however you wanna call it, Carl. Um, he can walk so fast when he is uh, giving you a tour. We went to London, we went to Bath, we went to Wales. We climbed old castles, we walked through countrysides and gardens, sketched Stonehenge, and we even got to go to a professional soccer game because, as Ralph said, he had a great love of sports. He shared stories about his family and his kids, and just that experience um, and seeing the world through Carl's eyes just taught me so much. It solidified my love for cities and urban design. And um, he really encouraged me to take that non-traditional career path where I would focus on planning cities and campuses for higher education. And that was not something that I felt like I could do until he really encouraged me to do that. After I graduated, I found myself using Carl's words of wisdom um, and his catchy phrases with coworkers and clients. Whenever we'd have interns um, come that were students at Maryland, I'd always ask them for an update on Carl and how his retirement was going because I went to that retirement party for Ralph and Carl where they pretended that they were gonna retire and stop teaching. And I was so fortunate that um, this past spring before the pandemic, I was able to come to the school and have a great catch up with him and see his smiling face. When I read about his passing, I was sitting in the car um, outside of a grocery store and I just started crying. And I was surprised that I had such a huge reaction um, to someone that you know was just a teacher but then I realized that we didn't just lose a teacher we lost a mentor and a friend and I was sad for all the future generations of students that will never get to take his class or create their list of Dupuyisms as um, Don said which really to me was a rite of passage for everyone to do as a class at Maryland um, then I was inspired by the, the Facebook posts and the memories that were shared by so many of my friends and classmates and just realizing the, the impact that he's made on all of our lives. And I'll just share two that I think come to me the most um, throughout my uh, career and, and life. And it was two of the quotes he said a lot. Um, one was access equals value. And he would tell us that in context of a city, um, having access to water or a railroad was what would create the value and spur development when it was formed. But I've come to realize that um, access to education, resources, and great people adds value. And Carl was accessible to all of us, and that's what made him great. He loved teaching and loved his students, and we can keep adding value by sharing all the things he's taught us. And the last thing, he would ask us for each project um, or each city, what was your reason for being? Um, again, that was around our design or a city. He wanted us to always know that so what about every project. But I feel like this rhetorical question has stuck with me for 15 years and I just know that one of Carl's reasons for being 
was to spark a fire in generations of students and colleagues to design great places, to value the urban fabric, to ask good questions, and always to strive to learn more. So let's keep getting to work and continuing to uh, share his legacy for future generations. I recently learned something remarkable about one of my dad's famous Dupuyisms. And since I can't dance and it's too wet to plow, I may as well share it with you now. Many of you know about my father's canoeing trips with colleagues and friends in the Boundary Waters. Well, my mom reports that the kayaking bug first caught him while living in New York City in the 1970s. He and his friend Bruce bought a two-seat model and were impatient to try it out, so they and their wives packed a picnic lunch and headed out in search of a lake. Unfortunately, most of the nearby bodies of water were actually reservoirs for the city, and recreational boating, apart from fishing, was prohibited. Eventually, they could retrain, restrain themselves no longer, and at one particularly charming and secluded lake, Carl and Bruce ignored the posted signs and launched their kayak while Peg and Linda, awaiting their turn afloat, set up a picnic on the banks of the reservoir. It was a peaceful and idyllic moment. And then they heard a booming voice coming from behind them. Well, isn't this a pretty sight? The state trooper exclaimed. So to all the generations of my father's students who found themselves in the receiving end of that particular greeting, <laughs> ominous but with a twinkle in the eye, now you know the origin story. I'm Rick Dupuy, one of Carl's two children. Along with my mother, Peg Kepner, and my brother, Paul Dupuy, I want to thank the School of Architecture for hosting today's event. It was really good to hear the remembrances of Sidney Brower and John Hill, and I especially want to thank Ralph Bennett and Jessica Leonard for their very moving tributes. The thing about being the son of an architecture professor, or at least the son of Carl Dupuy, is that you can't help seeing the world through those eyes. Every building or street has a story, and whether exploring far afield or just strolling in your own neighborhood, you can hardly turn around without spotting a question in brick and mortar right for discussion and debate. To this day, I find myself filling up my phone with photos of buildings that caught my eye to show dad. And I know that when I visit the Roman ruins at Tim God someday, I'll feel an urge to show him all the evidence that its builders, as he liked to claim, had taken his course. Some of my earliest memories are of visiting the architecture school with my father. I remember playing on the map of Manhattan on the floor of the great space, browsing for hours in the library while dad made his studio rounds, and visiting Mrs. Alley in the slide room, where I later worked my first teenage job. In more recent years, my dad loved to take Paul and me to Terps games, where we'd pretend not to be embarrassed by those impossibly loud cheers, boos, and critiques, with all due respect, of the referees, much to the amusement of his architecture school friends sitting nearby. But although I've always known my dad as a professor of architecture, he only wound up there fortuitously, as he put it in a brief essay about his life, which he wrote for his 50th undergraduate reunion a few years ago. My father, who was known as Rick in his younger years, grew up in Quincy, Illinois, along with his brothers Jack and Bill. At the age of 15, dad made his first big overseas adventure, attending the World Scout Jamboree in England and getting to visit Venice en route. And there's a photo of that somewhere out there. He attended Dartmouth on an NROTC scholarship and planned to join the Marines, but the commissioning physical turned up a minor back problem ending his military career. Given this unexpected opportunity to move in a different direction, one of his professors at Dartmouth suggested architecture school at the University of Pennsylvania. While at Penn, dad won a traveling fellowship, which in retrospect, he viewed as a turning point in his life. It yielded, he wrote in that reunion essay, quote, four months of intense travel in and around Europe studying architecture and experiencing cities, landscapes, and cultures. This, this trip convinced me that I wanted not only to practice architecture, but also to share my observations with others. Similarly, he wrote that another long overseas trip a decade later, quote, piqued my interest in teaching and confirmed that there is no substitute for firsthand experience when building a catalog of precedents for teaching urbanism and architecture. In short, as you all know, my father wasn't primarily an architect of the textbook or the lecture podium or the drafting board or even the slide projector. He was one of shoe leather. He loved to get out into the world and see things with his own eyes. And as his son, I often got to tag along with him. I unfortunately can't recall anything of his famous sabbatical year in India since I was two. Just think, he and my mother took a two-year-old to India for a year. But I remember visiting the castles of North Wales, the Bastides of Aquitaine, and the fan-shaped Schlosspark in the aptly named city of Karlsruhe. 
I remember climbing the Iron Age hill fort at Maiden Castle and then debating the pros and cons of Prince Charles's pet project at Poundbury nearby. And I remember taking time in Edinburgh to pace out the wits of the alleyways of James Craig's new town of 1766. But of course, my, my brother Paul and I weren't the only ones who got to tag along. Generations of students enjoyed the same forced marches something I was lucky enough to see firsthand as my father's gopher on a few of the many student trips he led, or in visiting him during one of his semesters abroad at his beloved Kiplin Hall. Just as I was blown away by the students sketching and watercolor skills, I know that they were blown away by my father's irresistible energy and curiosity. He, in his turn, would argue that it was his students who kept him young, and that thanks to their fresh eyes, he saw new things every trip. My father's devotion to his students was always very apparent, and even in his illness the spring and summer, he was looking forward to spending another semester with this year's batch of thesis students. He concluded that 50th reunion essay by reporting that my brother Paul once asked him why he spent all of his time teaching and administering a Maryland's architecture program instead of working in a firm and designing buildings. I responded, he wrote, by showing him a number of fine buildings, all of which happened to have been designed by my former students. That is my legacy. I taught them well. I'm very proud of my students. They no longer surprise me with their efforts. They continue to produce wonderful reflections of their education. Thank you all very much for being here today. And as you will be unsurprised to hear, I feel more like I do now than I did when I came in. <laughs> well, thank you, Rick. And thank you, Ralph. And thank you, Jessica, for uh, these wonderful tributes to Carl, um, uh, a, a guy with a, a huge amount of energy and one who made a real mark. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Brian Kelly, Associate Dean and Director of Architecture and Board of Visitors Chair, Craig Spangler. Thank you, Don, and thank you to all of the presenters this evening. Many of you forged your relationships with Sydney, Carl, and John as students. For some of us, these individuals were colleagues over the course of our careers, and they became part of our extended family. In the School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation family, each of these colleagues brought us together in their own distinct ways. Sydney always encouraged us to work more closely together to build bridges between architecture and urban planning. Since his retirement, Sydney would be happy to know his colleagues heeded his advice and experienced unprecedented success in interdisciplinary venues like the Gerald D. Hines Urban Land Institute uh, International Student Competitions. Maryland is one of the top teams in that competition, which brings together architecture, planning, and real estate development. Carl reminded us that buildings make cities and that cities are made of buildings. To do well as an architect, you must also be an urban designer, and that to be an effective urban designer, you need to understand buildings. And Carl had an unrelenting passion and drive for teaching students about architecture in the city. And right up to the end, as you heard this evening, Carl made his students his first and foremost priority. Already, I miss his daily announcement, which still can echo throughout the great space, the urban train is leaving the stations. John laid the foundations for the school that we know today. He was a selfless and very remarkable leader. John and I eventually became close friends and ski buddies, and we would take uh, trips uh, uh, on, uh, on long rides up the mountain in a chairlift, and we would talk uh, to one another about the school. John was an interesting character. He was a we person which is remarkable in today's me-oriented world. He would end every faculty meeting with the challenge that we needed to go out and do things for the good of the order. He placed well-being of others and the needs of the school before himself. We've heard that several times this evening. I don't know many people that do that anymore. When eventually I became director of the architecture program, I regularly reached out to him for advice, particularly on the rare occasion when I needed to deal with faculty morale problems. And John's advice was always sage, and he remained forever the optimist 
who believed that people would do the right thing if you just gave them encouragement and the chance. So if you stick around a place long enough, it kind of grows on you. I came to Maryland 33 years ago, got to know all of these people. And since then, the School of Architecture and Planning and Preservation has become even more important to me than my two alma maters. Sydney, Carl, and John understood this when they established funds that will well into the future give back to students. They were inspirational for me to do the same. Sydney, Carl, and John will continue to live and positively impact students through the good that these funds will do for future generations of architects, planners, preservationists, and real estate developers. John, Carl, and Sydney, thank you for making the school a better place. Catherine, Peg, Cynthia, and families, thank you for sharing these remarkable people with us. And now I'd like to turn it over to Craig Spangler. Good evening, thank you, Brian. Tonight, we've all been so moved to hear from our speakers about the many ways their lives have impacted and even transformed by Sydney, John, and Carl. I'm sure that all of you who have joined us this evening feel the same way. I know that I do. Although I didn't have the opportunity to experience Sydney's teachings, I sure wish I had while at Maryland. I did spend the last five years of John's tenure as Dean of the school while I was at Maryland from 1977 to 1982. I always admired John's congenial manner his eloquence and professionalism, emblematic of how I envision myself as an architect. I was extraordinarily fortunate to have had Carl for both urban design and fourth year studio amongst many juries throughout my career at the school. Obviously, hoping to not get the dreaded NG he would inscribe on his knee while he was getting ready to react to your designs. His passion for the ur urban environment was so infectious. Given his education at the University of Pennsylvania, Carl frequently used Philadelphia in his urban design class and for studio projects. With his love of travel, he took our studio to Philadelphia to educate us about the city and to see the Rosenbach Museum, which was one of the focus of our studio projects. As a Philadelphia native and now with a house just around the corner from the Rosenbach, I pass by there frequently and every time I do, I'm always reminded about how Carl inspired my own passion for building in an urban environment and on designing buildings for college and universities, including several at the University of Maryland. These three legends have dedicated their careers to making all of our lives better. In addition to the incredible work, they also generously gave back to the school in ways that will impact our students for generations to come. These include the Sydney Brower International Travel Scholarship that supports travel by graduate students in the urban studies and planning program for presenting work at an international conference and for taking a curriculum related course in foreign country. The John W. Hill Endowed Scholarship directly supports scholarships for students enrolled in the architecture program, giving them the chance to gain professional experience or pursue academic research in a relevant field. And tonight, I'm pleased to announce the creation of the Carl F.G. Dupuy Lecture that will support a lecture in urban design inspired by Carl's passion. I hope you will be able to join me in supporting one or more of these funds and helping to ensure that Sidney John and Carl's legacy will continue for generations. You can, port, can support these funds now online by visiting the URL on the screen. You can also contact Leah for more information or other ways to support the school. Thank you for joining us to celebrate the lives of Sydney, John, and Carl tonight, and for all the ways that you support the school. And now I'll turn it back over to Don. Thank you, Brian and Craig, and a huge thank you to all of the speakers who joined us tonight and provided such lovely tributes. And a special thanks to Leah and Erica for bringing us all together tonight in this wonderful event. Sydney, John, and Carl have left a lasting legacy on the school that as Dean, I strive to build on every day through our mission to advance excellence in education, scholarship, and professional practice toward just and resilient communities. I'm reminded that the tumultuous times we are living in now are intimately similar 
to the national environment, John Hill and our first faculty and students endured over 50 years ago when the school was started. The foundation built by John Hill and championed by Sidney Brower and Carl Dupuy is today more vital to our school and students than ever. We will continue to train future generations, scholars and practitioners to tackle the big challenges of our time and to innovate and collaborate, to build the equitable, diverse, and beautiful environments richly deserved by all. As we move forward, I urge you, our MAP community, to stay connected. You are our greatest asset and have paved the path our students will follow. Again, thank you all for coming tonight to remember these good friends and colleagues. Good night and God bless.